Hello and welcome to the first tutorial. This one's going to be a free one for all you people out there. Um, as you can tell, I've obviously started a Patreon page to try and hopefully service the uh, astronomy community with some pretty good stuff. Now, I understand that there are other things out there that are considered free, um, but the only difference here is I'm going to kind of dive into a little bit more depth and some of the settings and things like that. And today, in this particular one, I'm going to be looking at the Eagle Nebula. Uh, I've already acquired the data, and this will be available for you guys to download for free, uh, so you guys can have a go at it. And let's get started. So, of course, depending on how you use to capture the images and all that kind of stuff, you kind of want it to have everything set up. So, first things first is to get all your files in folders and in order so in my case I didn't do any flat frames um, sometimes I just don't find the need to uh, in this particular case uh, it probably doesn't really affect the image at the end of the day because obviously I've already checked the footage over already now I've set everything up so it's all in lights uh, darks and biases and there is a reason why I'm doing it in this particular fashion and we're going to get started. So the program that we're looking at this time round is going to be Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, there's multiple versions of it. There's a 64 bit, there's a 32 bit. And obviously this one's complaining about being updated, but I'm just going to ignore that for now because for this purpose, it's going to be fine. So first of all, we need to import all our files um, into Deep Sky Stacker. So the easiest way to do is just to drag and drop as I'm doing right now and then telling the system what type of file it is. So I'm pulling in the lights, now I'm pulling in the darks. So I make sure I select the darks, and then the biased, and I select biased. So as you can see, it sorts everything out to which type it is, and you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So with the Eagle Nebula, um, we're gonna just basically just check our data to make sure it's good. This particular image was actually done with a ASI 1600, which most people seem to have, so it's quite a common camera. Um, always good to use a common camera just so, it, for the sake of the workflow, everyone's somewhat the same. Then we can check some of the information here, the exposure, uh, how long it's done for, the type of bias frames, etc. Now, what I'm also gonna start looking at is we need to kind of check through each frame. I mean, I'm one of these p persons that I stay up all night, I check out everything and go through things one at a time as the data comes down so I can see it happening live, essentially. So I'm just going to quickly go through and check all the sub frames and make sure everything's good. And you may notice a tiny, tiny bit of movement, but that's okay. So what I'm doing is, oh, so we've got a bizarre frame here where it suddenly flipped around. That's probably because of the meridian flip. So there's a file that we need to remove from the list. So we just simply right click and remove it. So it's not in the list any longer. So now we're pretty much ready to begin. Now this is typically what trips everybody over is what should the settings be? So let's start looking into some of these. We're going to click on register, uh, register clicked pictures. Uh, typically, I just use that because it's the easiest way. It just kind of does everything for you. And there's a couple of warnings here and there. You can pretty much ignore them for pretty much most of the time. This part here is the advanced section. So we're going to look at the uh, advanced tab here. Um, this, what this basically does is it detects the stars to do the actual alignment procedure. So there's a slider here uh, that goes from pretty much 2 through to 98. Uh, by default, it's typically set to 10, and I'm just going to run this just to see what it's doing or show you what it's doing. And then you can see it's counting how many stars uh, there are in the actual image. And the idea here is, is you need a good amount of stars to be able to do the actual uh, tracking part of the process. So what happens here is, is in Deep Sky Stacker, it looks at each one and it's kind of like a plate solve. 
and then it looks at the next picture and it aligns everything up. So what it will do is it will automatically adjust and rotate each image to be able to be layered on top of each other since we are actually stacking. Of course, you can do this by hand, but you know why do something manually when you can get a program to do it, of course. And just to show you what happens if we reduce the percentage, you will actually see that the number of stars actually drops dramatically. Uh, typically, I prefer to at least have 100 stars. Um, so in this particular case, the default setting is absolutely fine. We're just going to leave it at 10%. Um, and go from there. So the next thing that we're going to look at now is the stacking parameters. Um, the reason why I'm looking at that instead of the recommended settings is because this is trying to tell you how to do this on the most common settings. So you're going to first of all come up against the results window and this is the different way of clipping or cropping the actual image. So typically most people will probably just use standard mode. You can kind of see what it's trying to do here. Uh, mosaic is, is obviously if you're trying to produce some kind of a mosaic. However, this does not actually create mosaics. All it does is it just randomly selects areas and then tries to create the biggest image possible, especially if the scene is kind of jumping around all over the place. Uh, intersect mode basically cuts out all the parts and only uses what's actually worth using. Uh, typically, I prefer to use intersection mode as opposed to any of the other two because then it saves me having to crop things out. So there are two other settings here, which is drizzling. Um, basically, what this does is it will enlarge the pixel. So if you have a camera or a shot that would be considered uh, undersampled, I would probably recommend you using the 2x drizzle in this particular case. Uh, this is a monochrome image, so we are not doing the RGB for the uh, final alignment, so I'm not worried about that. We have a couple of things down at the bottom. Uh, depending on how good or bad your computer is, uh, I would recommend you use uh, reduce work threads priority and use all processors available. The obvious answer for the use all process uh, processors of is you know if you've got a machine that has multiple cores, it'll use as many as it can. Speeds up the process, that kind of stuff. Reduce worker thread priority is basically it's going to utilize your machine in such a way where it doesn't actually hammer the machine. So let's just say um, this thing is in the foreground and you've got a bunch of things running around in the background or you're doing a bunch of other things. You kind of want to do this in the background. So by clicking on that, reduce worker threads places the actual program into the background so it runs and it doesn't interrupt other things that you might be doing if this was your only machine. Since uh, we're not running multiple things, I'm just going to keep this ticked off for now because this is pretty much dedicated for this sole purpose. Then we're going to look at the light tab. So there is multiple different settings here and people are going, oh my gosh, what does all of this mean? Um, typically these are the different type of stacking modes. You can actually do a lot of reading up on the internet for what this all means. Uh, average basically looks at the average value of a pixel and then basically goes for that. Median is, as it says, it's the median number of a particular value. Uh, so typically when people turn around and say an average number between six and say nine would be something like about, well, I don't know, seven. Uh, because that's where the average would be, whereas a median would be if more numbers favor a certain number, it'll favor that number. So in other words, if most of your stuff reports as an 8, it'll be closer to 8 than it would be as a 7. Um, that's essentially what that is. Kappa Sigma clipping, median uh, Sigma clip, uh, clipping. Again, different types of stacking methods. It typically uses the mean number. If you mouse over it, it does actually say what the actual mathematic formula is. So if you've ever remembered in mathematics, you've got mean, median, and mode. Uh, typically speaking, most people who want to average something in a mathematical formula would use something like the mean number, hence why kappa sigma clipping is a viable option. In this particular case, we're not concerned about any of that. The only two that we're going to want to use most of the time because of the amount of frames that we're actually doing is just going to be average and medium. Uh, typically, if you have a lot of frames, it's actually better to use the other types of formulas, kappa sigma, medium kappa sigma, auto adaptive weight average, 
and high dynamic range for uh, entropy weighted. But this is only applicable if you have a high number of subs. So let's just say you did over the course of say two, uh, two or three days and you've collected well over 100 images for a lack of better description, you would probably start looking at using one of those other things. If you find that you have a lot of uh, areas like the Orion Nebula where the core tends to blow out, uh, high dynamic range as a stacking mode tends to actually be better, especially if you're trying to reduce that and bring it back out. Um, obviously in Deep Sky Stacker it doesn't process anything, we are just using it for the stacking purposes. If you're using other programs like PixInsight, there's other advantages and disadvantages behind it, obviously, uh, learning curve being a big disadvantage in my mind. Uh, but in this particular case, we're gonna try and keep this as simple as possible, and we're just gonna simply choose average. Now, dark frames is a similar principle uh, behind all of this, and the idea here is, is we're gonna pick a similar setup in this case. Uh, typically, I will just use median because I just want the median number. In other words, the most common value that it's going to give. I'm not going to use any of the other settings. What I'll also do is dark, uh, sorry, hot pixel detection and removal with dark optimization. If I was using a CCD camera, I would do bad column detection and removal as well. But obviously, this is actually a CMOS camera. CMOS cameras do not have uh, column defects as they're pretty much known as. Typically, what you would find uh, as a, co a column defect, they call them warm columns, is a very long line that kind of runs up through the frame. Some are worse than others, uh, but CMOS cameras do not have bad columns. Um, if you ever see a bad column, something's seriously wrong with your camera, to be totally, totally honest. But in this case, we're using a CMOS camera, so hot pixel detection and removal with dark optimization, and that's all going to be set on, and that's going to be left at... Um, median. Offset bias, uh, again, we're going to just leave this as medium, not a lot of settings to really go through um, for this particular case. If you shoot a lot of bias frames, um, the better it gets. You kind of may want to double check your bias frames to make sure that the noise behind that it's creating is somewhat random or if not overly uniform. So just to uh, explain what I'm talking about, I'm going to look at a bias frame and I'm just going to raise the levels up so we can really see what's going on. So if I go through and check between one versus the other, the noise should be relatively random. And anything that shows up like a hot pixel is what is actually going to get removed. Um, again, most of the times, uh, these bias frames work incredibly well, unlike what the dark frames do. It depends entirely on each camera. So a dark frame would typically remove all these strange looking areas. So in this case, we have what is known as amp glow. And you can see in the corners, something's going on here where it's obviously lighter uh, in these corners, but darker more in the middle. This is a kind of typical of a 1600 where there is a darker band that runs dead center, um, two hot corners on top of bottom, and this really faint fudge smear, for lack of a better description, is on this side. Usually when I see that, I, I can kind of tell this is a, uh, a 1600. It's, it has its very specific characteristic, um, and every camera has its own thing. The great thing here is it's always uniform, it's always there, and it can always be calibrated out. So we're gonna go back into the settings real fast. So now we're gonna look at the alignment. Um, this is actually kind of important uh, based upon how the images are aligned. Uh, most people just set this to automatic because you just allow it depending on the number of stars. Obviously it says so in the description, but you can pick certain types of alignment uh, if you're gonna have trouble with certain things, especially if you're taking pictures and there are very few stars in the field, you can actually use uh, these different functions. Um, typically, leave it at automatic, let the machine work it out, and you'll be pretty much safe. Uh, intermediate files uh, create calibrated frames and all this kind of stuff. This is not actually all that critical. Um, what this allows you to do is it will save calibrated frames for you and it will even register them. And the idea behind doing that is if you want to get rid of your FITS files afterwards, once they've been processed and you only want to keep uh, 
the calibrated frames, you can actually do this. Uh, depending on if you have a color camera or a monochrome, you can also debayer all the information and save all of those out. And you can even create a register and calibrated file for each frame. Uh, saving format is obviously in TIFF and FITS. Um, ultimately, you should always be using FITS files uh, over TIFF. Uh, the FITS files basically just contains headers and information about the particular shot, and it's kind of useful to retain that information for uh, astronomical purposes or scientific data research, that kind of stuff, especially if you find something that could be of interest but you've already trashed the files and you think, oh my gosh, you know, if only I saw that earlier, you could have saved it. Uh, cosmetics. So this is a um, what tends to be a little bit more complicated for most people and you kind of need to understand how your camera works in order for this to actually work properly. So what this actually does is it's looking at what we refer to as cold and hot pixels. Hot pixels typically show up as one white pixel and cold pixels typically show up as just straight up black. So you have a, a value assigned to these depending on the bit depth of your uh, particular camera. So in the 1600s case, it can have a gray value anywhere up to like 65,000 plus um, numbers, or it can have a zero value. Typically, if it sees a zero value, it must mean it's a cold pixel. And if one particular pixel has hit the, basically the ceiling, which is like the 65,000 plus, number, it is considered a hot pixel. What this part does is it'll look at each individual pixel, assign that value. If it meets those requirements, it'll remove it. And what we can do is we can set how strong this is going to be. Uh, and then we can also change the size of how big those pixels need to be. Uh, ultimately, just leave it on one pixel size unless you were shooting something very specific or you were doing something specific where you shot pixel binning, for example. So if you were to bin the camera, say two by two, you need to up this to two pixels. Hence why the biggest number you can get up to is actually six. Because typically, if you were to bin, you will never exceed six by six binning. I mean, you just end up with just a giant square and it's not very, very interesting. Uh, again, you can save an image showing the clean pixels for each frame if you just wanted to do some testing or you wanted to check up on the camera. This is actually kind of uh, interesting sometimes when you can actually look at how much has been stripped out versus how much is actually left behind. Uh, in this case, I'm going to turn it off because I don't particularly need it, nor am I going to really test my camera because I know it works. Output files, um, pretty straightforward here. We can do all of these different types of parameters, um, change the names of things however I want to do it. Uh, I don't need to create an HTML description file so we can leave that unchecked. Output name, just leave it as auto save. Um, always have append numbers to avoid overwriting. So it basically, if a file shows up that has the same name, it'll automatically create version one, two, three, four, and so forth and so on. Now the output location is I can choose to be I can choose for where it to go or I can leave it in the same folder. Again, it just depends on where you want to put all these files. Uh, typically, I just leave them in the same folder. So when I actually go back to it, I know where it is. I can find it pretty quickly. Um, last but not least is temporary files and folders. M Nine times out of 10, most people tend to leave this alone, but in some cases you may not have a lot of space, but you might have an external hard drive. Um, you can use this by clicking on this and then going to that drive and selecting it so it can store the temporary files somewhere that's a little bit more useful. Or if you're one of these people that plans to clear, clear out the cache once in a while because you, know, you keep running out of space, because let's face it, this stuff takes up a lot of space. Um, you can choose where it will go and you can remove it or find it quickly. So once we've set all of these, again, um, you only need to set these once typically. Um, we can just simply OK it. And then if we check the recommended settings, it'll tell you, you know, what other settings that it should recommend. In this particular case, because of the amount of bias frames I've taken, it's recommending I use Sigma clipping medium combination method. But again, I'm just going to simply ignore it and just go on from there. So once we've got all of that set, we're gonna basically click on okay, 
and this will tell me some of the information of what's going on, the exposure time, assuming that your FITS files have all the uh, information available, the type of stacking, and it's like your last chance to change any particular settings if you wanted to. Uh, remember this particular case, this is not a color picture that we're processing here, this is a mono picture. So again, just gonna check through this, make sure this is all correct. We don't have any flat frames, and we are pretty much ready to go. So I'm gonna click OK, and off this thing goes, and as soon as it's all done, we're gonna come back and then check the file. So we're coming into the part where the actual stacking is actually occurring because it's gone through all the uh, processing and the calibration part of the uh, stacking procedure. And you're gonna notice that this is actually telling us how much movement is actually occurring. You can see by the offset. Now the offset is always based upon one image that it will select based upon the score of the file which I will show you that in just a moment once this is actually done. And it will even calculate the angle, assuming that you have any type of rotation. Uh, ideally, we don't really want to see this number moving because if it moves, it means that I have a possible problem of field rotation over a period of time, which typically results in stars looking like streaks and things like that. But in my particular case, um, I managed to get all of that worked out so I didn't have that problem. So now it's basically building up the final image and this is where we can start some of the pre-processing side of things to try and get the image uh, looking good before we actually take it into a program to process anything. So this is typically a histogram with the curves. Um, now bearing in mind this is not stretch data so what we have to do here is we need to try and bump everything up so we can see everything. Uh, to make your life easier, instead of clicking and then trying to drag this thing around, you can actually click on the arrow and use the left and right key on your keyboard to shift it around. And the idea here is, is we try to want to get a image uh, to look somewhat uh, pleasing uh, to the eye, uh, depending on how your monitor is calibrated, it may be different from one to the other, but I'm just gonna show you one extreme case where I'm gonna set it too high, and you can kinda see everything kinda just washes out uh, and all that data is gone. Um, strangely enough, it's actually quite recoverable because it's just set a bunch of values. Um, in this particular case, when we are doing this kind of stuff, it's always gonna save as a 16-bit file, meaning that we actually have the ability to work with over 16 million shades of gray, as opposed to uh, 65,000, which is typical for something like 12-bit. Eight bits even less, it's t uh, only 256. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna set this to something a little bit more reasonable. Um, typically, I always just go with the halfway mark and I typically kind of just go by eye. So once I've applied this, I kind of get an idea for this. So it's not that bad, but I'm gonna try and pull some of this back a little bit because it's a little bit overblown. Uh, what I wanna see is, I, I wanna see some of the actual nebulosity here and but still keep parts you know, in dark, and just basically have a nice flat image. I don't want it too contrasty because we're going to basically change all of that in Photoshop. So I might want to just brighten that just a tiny, tiny bit. And again, this is all based upon um, an aesthetical type of thing. You don't have to follow this particular method. I just prefer to have a little less contrast because it's just easier to work when you're doing the processing part of it and you know, making it look nice. So as it stands, if I was to save out this image, we actually get a pretty good image. And some people would be pretty happy with this without processing it, but you know, we can go in and tweak out more of this and get rid of some of this noise that we see here. So once we've done that, we need to save this image. Uh, to the left-hand side, it says save picture to file uh, and then I'm just going to put this on the desktop and I'm going to name it something so I know what it's called. So I'm going to call this the Eagle Nebula and the type of file is I'm going to be using is going to be a TIFF image and I only need it to be in 16-bit. There's no point doing 32-bit unless you're doing something very specific 
um, again, 16 bits fine. We don't want any type of compression, um, so we can see the true file size, and then simply click Save. And off it goes, and we should have somewhere on my desktop a picture of the Eagle Nebula, which is actually right here. Now, I'm just going to go back into uh, something here, just to go through some of this. Remember I was mentioning about the score? Uh, now that these files have actually been checked through, you can actually see a score uh, given on this. So what I'm going to do is look at the actual frame that was the reference frame, which is the one that scored the highest versus the one that scored the lowest. And what you can see is you can kind of check to see if there's any major differences. Typically when it shows a, a very, very low score versus a very, very high score, something might be wrong. So if you pay attention to these two stars here, if I go from one to the other, you'll notice one gets bigger and one gets smaller when I flick through the two. We're not worried about the actual movement per se. What that actually is, is the actual telescope acclimating over time to the temperature change. So the actual point of where it's in focus has shifted. Now, sometimes this can be quite a problem. In this particular case, it's not bloating that badly by comparison. So I can probably get away with it and just simply ignore it. But if I really wanted to get a, an image to be a lot tighter, what we can do is double check and remove anything that has a particularly low score or where these stars are starting to basically bloom out too much. And quite honestly, we just might want to simply remove them. Um, that does mean that it does cut down on the amount of time and the data. So the idea here would be is shoot more than you really need. So I'm actually going to go in and remove since we've already changed, uh, set all those files and remove some of those frames and then simply restack them so you can actually see the difference. So we've basically lost uh, 50 minutes or so uh, compared to the previous image. But we're going to run through this process again, but only stack the ones that have a higher score just so you can see the difference when we do a side by side comparison. So once this is done, um, we will open up the files and then check them against each other so you can get an idea of what's happening. So we're going to go into Photoshop now and we're going to open up the two files that we just saved on the desktop. So we can do a side by side comparison. So I'm just going to quickly do a quick stretch just to check these. But what we're going to look at first of all is what the difference is between having stacked a higher score versus the lower score and, and see if there's any difference. And the difference is there, but it's very, very subtle. So let's just zoom in to say 50% um, or even 100%, just make it uh, so we, we can flick between the two. So this is the lower scoring and this is the higher scoring. Uh, what you're noticing right off the bat is there is actually a slight shift that you can actually see that the pixels will move ever so slightly, but more importantly, this is the two hour and 10 minute version. Let's look at this star here. If I flick between the two, you will notice the star actually get bigger and smaller when I flick between the two. And then if I look at the nebulosity in this area here, you can actually see one looks smoother and the other one actually looks sharper. Now I'm actually gonna disregard the noise for a moment because I'm trying to do a frame comparison here to see what has happened or what is actually going on. And in actual reality, it didn't do a bad job. Uh, some of the bad frames has caused some of the stars to bloom, but you know, we, we've, we're going from a score from 1900 as low as 1000, and the ones that score 1000 just simply aren't really helping me. Um, the good thing here is though, because of the focal length of the scope, I'm not too worried. I could probably get away with using something like this and again, this is more of a preference for everybody else, depending on what it is that they want to do. But for this particular case, we're going to go look at the one with the highest score, and that's the one we're going to process. So we're going to shut that one down, and we're going to revert this back to its original form, because we want to control how much is brought out of the actual image. So the first thing we want to do is we want to do a histogram stretch, and you can do that by going into levels.
uh, you can set it automatic if you want to. Uh, typically this does not give you a good result. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go in and just stretch some of that data out. Just check to see how good or bad it is. And already we can see it's getting a lot better. So we've done a single pass for the actual histogram stretch. So now if we go back in, it, you can suddenly see this has opened up a lot more and we can basically go in and tighten that up even further. Now, the important thing here is, is we've got to be careful with what's happening here in the core of the uh, Eagle Nebula, or more commonly known as the Pillars of Creation. We don't want this to go white out. So we have to be very, very careful not for that to happen. The best way to do it is using this slider, all we're doing is brightening up the, the highlighted areas, and then we can move into the mid-levels and change this slider to bring up more or less of the nebulosity. Now remember, you don't want to try and over crank this, otherwise the whole thing blows out and it just very, it seems very, very washed out and opaque looking. So the idea here is you want to bring it up and you want to look at some of the nebula or the nebulosity areas around here and just double check to make sure if it's actual nebula or if it's just a dark part of space. And you want this to be just visible. You don't want to have it overpowering uh, to the point where we're going to have to do a lot of post-processing to clip some of that out. So I'm going to go for a happy medium where it's just uh, detectable. And again, depending on your screen, it may look better or worse for some people. And once I get it, I may clip some of that off on the other end just to give some of that contrast back. But I'm only going to probably do it by a value of one, maybe uh, just to get rid of some of the bad areas. So once I've done that, we have now gone from the original image before we did the histogram stretch, which is this black image here, which shows very little information to what we see now. Uh, if you're wondering how I did that, that was actually in the histories tab. You can just simply select through all the different variants that we've gone through. Now, the problem here with doing any type of histogram stretch is the amount of noise we see is now becoming more and more obvious. So as I look around the actual framing, we can see where noise is more obvious than there is signal. So obviously where there's a high signal area, it gives you the illusion that it's actually a lot smoother uh, than it really is. But that's what we're gonna do next is to get rid of some of this noise. Uh, personally, I don't mind the noise per se. It, it just helps to keep the actual image looking uh, somewhat real as opposed to a heavily airbrushed image. Some people tend to overprocess, but it, it just depends on your preference. So first things first is there are multiple ways of doing this. Um, typically, if you're using a newer version of Photoshop in this uh, particular case, I'm using the latest version. I actually like to go into the camera raw settings. Now remember, we are working off of a 16-bit file here, so there is actually a lot more data than the eye can see compared to what is actually there. Again, this shows us the histogram, uh, and this tells us all the different parts of what is exposed, etc., etc. So we've got the blacks, we've got the, the whites, the highlights, and the uh, shadows and things like that, and it kind of gives us an idea of what we can play with. So let's get started with actually manipulating uh, this image. So what I want to do first is I kind of want to do noise control first because uh, I want to be able to get rid of some of this uh, fuzzy, grainy, not looking noise uh, for lack of better description. So first of all, uh, I usually come into this tab here. It just looks like uh, two triangles, one behind each other. Uh, one's sharpening and the other one is the noise reduction. And basically, it's the luminance slider that we need is basically what removes the noise. What I'm gonna try and do here is get a, a balance between the two before it basically gets looking too uh, smooth and funny looking. Um, you can actually play around with all the different settings uh, depending on what it is that you're trying to achieve, but I'm just gonna give this a quick once over just to get it to look as smooth as possible. Now depending on how much detail you're trying to retain, the more luminance we add, the more detail um, we seem to lose. And if you look at this area here, so I'm just gonna focus in on just this part here, we can actually see 
some of that faint wispy detail is starting to disappear the more we go up. So we can actually control that. You can actually set this to its maximum for, a, for fun and we can play around with these sliders to see how much detail is retained versus how much is lost. Um, by default, the default setting on this is actually not that bad, so if it was at 50, um, we can just about get away with it. But I don't want to lose too much of this detail, so I'm going to come in and fine tune this. Uh, if you look at the contrast, this basically shows any of the areas that have higher detail, we can bring some of that contrast back in to bring that detail back in. So as you can see, it makes quite a difference as we pull that along. So let's just set everything to 100% first of all, and we're gonna work backwards. So when everything's at 100%, we're gonna look at the, uh, the previous image, or when it's completely turned off, versus when it's all turned on. And we're trying to find a happy medium between the two. So I don't want all the noise gone, but I don't want this thing looking like some weird, smooth looking cloudy image, even though that's theoretically what it should probably look like. So I'm gonna probably go for a you know, happy medium. We're gonna go with a halfway mark and check that to make sure we're not getting any strange artifacts. I'm just gonna zip around looking in different areas to make sure it doesn't look too weird. And so far it does look okay. I'm going to lower the contrast and see how much of a difference it makes. And it's very, very subtle but something is actually happening. So I'm gonna bring that down a little bit. And then I'm just gonna take the detail slider and just double check to make sure we are not losing too much data. So I'm probably, I'm probably gonna bring that back down to probably the halfway mark because that seems like a pretty happy medium for me. And then we're just gonna simply okay that just to check our results. And again, this is where the history tab works wonders because we can flick between the two. And if we're looking in this area here, you can see it's done a pretty good job of removing some of that noise without losing all of that data. So the next thing that we're gonna look at is we're gonna try and enhance the details. Now, again, this kind of seems counterintuitive, but this is why I prefer to remove the noise first because we don't wanna sharpen the noise. We're now gonna go back into the camera raw and Photoshop actually has uh, some incredibly useful settings when it comes down to doing enhancements. So again, we're gonna look at this histogram and this tells us all the areas that we are going to affect and these sliders here correlate to what goes on here. So now if I ch look at the exposure tab, if I move this, I can actually see the histogram changing. Now, if you go by the general rule of thumb where you kind of want the most amount of data to go into the middle, well, we can have a problem with that. As we pull this along, everything starts to blow out and we're back to the same problem as we were before where this starts to look a little unrealistic and the hot areas start to get too much. But we're gonna actually bring up the exposure, but the problem areas, the highlights and the whites, we're gonna bring them back down. So you can see where the core's just gone crazy over there. And just to highlight it out, you can see what's going on there. I'm actually gonna pull that back. And I may end up pulling it back quite a lot. So we're gonna probably go for around about here and we're gonna check the highlights. We're gonna just play with the slider just to see the area that it affects and we're gonna to come to some happy position um, and then go from there. So, so far we've gotten rid of some of those nasty highlights and we're gonna have a look at what happens if we play around with the blacks. Now, remember this is a picture of space. Everything is supposed to be black. So again, we're gonna dial this back to where the nebulosity is still there, but only just barely visible. So that comes down as well and the shadows Again, this is a preference thing. I may actually bring that up to bring out some of the nebulosity, but without lifting the background too much. Now, if I find that areas here and here, for example, are starting to look a little bit washed out, we can actually increase or put some of this contrast back in to actually darken the background. And what that does is just, it just makes it punch out just a little bit more. So we don't need a lot, we're just gonna add a tiny amount and I kind of feel that the, the darker areas of the background is probably just still a little too washed out. So I'm gonna back that down even further 
and we're pretty much close to um, a final image here. Now, there are three other sections here, uh, texture, clarity, and dehaze. These are basically forms of sharpening. Uh, it's very, very similar to how deconvolution would work um, as opposed to clicking on multiple things and running an entire process, uh, it's actually all contained within the camera raw setting. So if I was to decrease the clarity or increase the uh, clarity, we can see obviously two different things happening here. So we're trying to sharpen this. Now we need to kind of get into the, some of the details here because what will happen here is, is we don't want to over sharpen this. Otherwise we start introducing noise all over again. So we're just going to put just enough clarity or sharpening just to have a small effect but without adding more noise back in. Now texture on the other hand is slightly different. What it does is it only increases the contrast of the black to try and give you some of that detail back in. But I'm actually going to leave this alone and leave it at zero because we're actually going to use a different technique to bring out some of that finer detail that we can see here, but without introducing a heavy, heavy amount of noise. So we're going to set that back to zero. And we're going to now look at what is called dehazing. Dehazing is typically used on pictures where if, if you had bad seeing um, and you were taking a picture of like say a cityscape or a landscape of some description, you can actually get rid of some of that hazing effect by playing around with the slider. It's very similar to how contrast works and it, and it darkens everything uh, depending on how high up you go. So what we're going to do is we are actually going to apply some of this dehazing, but you kind of want to look at the bigger picture, obviously. And this will actually help hide some of that noise without losing everything. And again, very subjective, but we're just going to be very, very subtle with this to a certain degree. And I want it just to make all that detail jump out and then knock the background, uh, the darker areas, so it goes darker. Once I've done with that, and I'm pretty happy with that result, I can apply everything and OK everything. And again, we can check the before and after results. Now here's the fun part. We're actually going to take this particular image and we're actually going to duplicate this. So we're actually going to do a clever little technique here. Now remember, we are working with a 16-bit file, so we're actually going to look at the high dynamic range of this image to pull out even more detail without introducing too much noise into this image. So first of all, I need to copy this. So it's uh, Control A to select all, Control C to copy, and then Control N will create a new file. And we're just going to say create, and then we're going to paste that in. So if you want to see this without doing the shortcuts with the Control A, Control C, is we're going to go into uh, Select, Select All, Edit. We're going to Copy. We're going to go create a new file. We're just going to simply OK it. Now, when you have something copied in the clipboard, as it says here, the values will be automatically set, so you don't have to guess that. Um, typically, it's done by, uh, done by default that it selects the clipboard. Simply OK it and we're going to go and paste the image in. So it's the same thing, uh, just done slightly differently. So I'm going to say no in this case. Now, first things first is you actually see two layers here. We need to flatten the image. We probably don't need to worry about that right this second because when you actually go to the uh, adjustments, it uh, will actually flatten it for you. So let's actually go into that process. It's actually under images uh, an HDR toning under adjustment. And it'll ask you, do you want to flatten this? And the answer is just simply yes. And what it does is we're now in the HDR toning. There are a couple of uh, presets in here. We're just going to go for default and all different types of ways HDR can be done. Uh, in this particular case, we are working with local adaption because we want to be able to control all of this that's going on here. So first of all, we need to look at the tone and the detail and the gamma is what gives all of this its brightness. And as you can see by default, how the HDR toning has extrapolated this particular image is it's telling me that the inside of here is overblown. In other words, there is obviously more data here or more signal than there is noise compared to the rest of the image. So we're going to use the gamma slider 
to actually lower that value. Now, we don't want to go too low, otherwise we get some very, very strange looking results and that's not what we're trying to do. We just need to lower this just enough to where the whites do not blow everything out. And it means, of course, some places it will blow out because obviously where all the stars are, um, they have already basically filled up the actual well depth and you know the value is already set to whatever the value would be that's ridiculously high. We can modify the exposure, so if we find that the image is a little too dark or a little too light, we can uh, play around with that. Now, in this particular case, we are going to be using this as a detail layer. So what I actually want to do is I want to pull some of it back because I don't want to introduce noise, but I want to keep some of that finer detail that we have inside of here. So I'm only interested in that, so I'm going to actually lower the exposure, but I might increase the gamma just so it doesn't blow it, um, so we have an area that isn't too overblown, or I could increase it, so we get to a good point there. And then the amount of detail that we can pull out, I mean, oh, there's there's 100%, and you know, that basically says everything. Uh, so I'm gonna go into here, and I just want just enough detail before it starts looking a little bit too much. So once I get to a happy medium, I think that looks pretty good. That's the detail we're going to be capturing. And then the edge glow, uh, what this does is it changes how much brightness on a particular edge uh, something has. Typically you'll see a better effect if it was a white square against a black background and you were to play with these things, you'll actually see how much dramatics this actually causes. But remember, this is nebulosity. So we've got two ways we can do this. Either I want to go to enhance the nebulosity or I'm going to go in to enhance the overall detail of the image. So we have to find, again, this happy medium, but without it looking overly processed. And by changing the slider, it will give you a better result or a worse result. It's typically speaking, um, I'm going to try and keep this like somewhere in the, towards the center and then I can play around with the strength of it if I, want, if I feel like I, I want to make some of that detail punch just a little bit more. But I'm only going to apply a very, very small amount because I want to keep those stars there. And once I've got that, I can then play around with the shadow and the highlights. So let's just set this back to zero for a moment. Now, I don't want to introduce a lot of bad information. So if I was to stretch this out, you can kind of see where the shadows actually are. And a lot of that is just not useful data. So we want to back that down to try and get rid of that bad noise. Uh, and then with the highlights, we kind of want to keep the core nice and bright, but we just don't want to overdo it. So it's very, very subtle and very small amounts. And then once we've got something like that, I think we're going to be pretty happy with that. We're going to OK all of this, allow your machine to process all of that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to select all, copy, and then we're going to paste this on top of the original image. So we now have two layers, one that has the higher details and one that has the original image. And you can see there's quite a difference here already, but what we're gonna do is we wanna blend these two images together to get our final image. Now we can do this in a multiple um, ways. That we can use any of these settings here, but typically what I prefer to do is I just simply change the opacity to actually blend the two images. So in, in other words, we're making this layer slightly transparent that then allows the background to bleed through and give us the final image. And you can see it does make quite a difference, especially in this area here where there was a lot of noise uh, from the previous image, but with, because of the way we set the dynamic range, a lot of that noise has been removed. So we're close to having a final image here. Um, I kind of feel like the the core here where the actual pillars of creation is, is probably a little too bright for my liking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten this image and I'm going to look at my levels and I'm probably just going to adjust this ever so slightly 
so it doesn't feel that it's kind of overpowering the image. So I'm going to mess with this just a slight amount until I get something that I'm actually happy with. And it wasn't too far from where it was by default, so we can flick between the two. And we have pretty much a final image that I'd be happy with and hopefully you will be happy with. Um, of course, if you feel the need to, you can obviously rotate the image uh, depending on which way round you kind of prefer it. I mean, typically you see the uh, Eagle Nebula like this, uh, facing one particular direction. But of course, in space, everything is somewhat relative. So I'm gonna look at a advanced tip here. And this is what was known as star reduction. There's multiple methods of doing the same thing. Uh, this is one particular method that I actually found out uh, and discovered, and I actually quite like it, and, and I use this method, is some of these stars, I kind of feel they're very, very distracting, and I, I just wish that I could just get them a little bit smaller so they're less you know, intrusive to the eye. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the image is actually flattened and everything, and I'm actually going to go into color range. And what this basically does is I'm actually going to pick an area that allows me to mask out some of these areas that I find very intrusive. So first of all, we need to actually pick the color. Uh, of course, it's black and white. We need to pick the highlights. And we change the fuzziness. So it only selects these stars, but not the nebula itself. And we can do a quick preview of all of that by simply just changing the preview selection to the mask or to the grayscale. Uh, I prefer to do the black because it tends to be a little bit uh, more accurate. And all I'm doing is I'm just looking for those harsh areas that I want to do without affecting too much of the original nebulosity as possible. So once we've got that set, we're going to OK that. And what this will do is it will draw a selection all around the stars that are the brightest. Obviously, some of the lighter ones won't get selected, but they're OK. Now, obviously, we've got a problem here. This is now selecting things that it shouldn't be selecting. So we need to kind of go in and kind of cut all of these out because we know that this is actually nebulosity. And we don't want to reduce that part because that's actually part of the data. Uh, there's another one here. And we're just going to just double double check all the other areas, make sure it hasn't selected anything that we don't want it to select. And if you find that it's kind of uh, removed or you've just kind of gone back in a room star, you can just simply go back in and draw it back in. It doesn't have to be accurate. So the next step here is to click on the select and we're going to modify our selection mask. So what I want to do first of all is we need to expand it because the idea here is if we try to reduce this area of where the stars are, it'll end up giving us really strange halo rings. So we're going to go to expand the actual uh, selection and we're going to set a value of three. That's three pixels all around and you'll notice that it'll suddenly grow to a certain size that will encompass the entire stars. Don't have to worry about if we've got other weird problems here because uh, that's going to be fixed in just a moment. We then go into modify. We're going to smooth everything out. We're going to just test it with one pixel first and that will just get rid of any harsh looking corners. So once we've smoothed that out, uh, we can then go back in and then we're going to feather this. Now feathering this means instead of having uh, a value of the pixel selected to create a harsh or a very hard looking box, I want to create a gradual fade. So I'm going to do a value of three which is basically three pixels, which is more than enough. And you'll notice that even the ones that the stars had been uh, cut out slightly have now been fixed. So any of the big, big stars have been kept. All the smaller ones have now been removed. So we can just double check that and just to make 100% sure that everything's good. Uh, I just spotted a problem area, so let's get rid of this. And I'm pretty confident that it's, this is going to work. So we're going to go into filters, we're going to go into other, and we're going to minimize. And the amount of 
the size to minimize, we can kind of pick it here. I mean, you can't go too crazy, otherwise weird things tend to happen. So we need to come up with a, a good number to work with. And what I like to do is I probably only want to go down by a handful of pixels. So one, maybe two pixels here and there. So three, maybe a little bit too much. And two seems to be about the right number. Now, one important thing here is, is you will notice that the stars are starting to have these weird points to them, almost like diffraction spikes. Um, I don't particularly like that because it seems a little uh, odd and a bit fake. So I need to preserve the roundness of these stars so we can see that they stay round and we're gonna okay that. And then we're going to remove the selection and then look at the final results. So we're gonna do the before and the after. So if you look at the stars, we're gonna go back to before we actually picked anything. And then we're gonna look and you can see the stars have actually been reduced ever so slightly but not completely removed. And what that does is it tones down the strength of some of the bigger stars, um, so it's less distracting in some ways, and you can actually concentrate more on the nebula itself. So that's one of the uh, little advanced tips on you know, doing some of the processing on these images. Hope you enjoyed that one, and I will see you on the next one.